Welcome to Deep Tech 315. Our first topic this week is applications, real world applications of artificial intelligence. Doug, you and I, we get asked this question a lot, like when the rubber hits the road, what are the use cases of AI? We saw something from Klarna, the buy now, pay later company that is thinking about going public. A few months ago, they talked about uh, these 700 support agents. Uh, their roles can be essentially eliminated through uh, using chatbots, customer satisfaction, being on par with humans, time for resolution being on average two minutes versus 12 with humans, kind of this pretty powerful uh, case. But they've been relatively few and far between, given all of the talk of AI, the kind of that the, the substance piece. But we picked up on a new one on from Walmart this week, and I'm going to read it, and then would love uh, for your perspective on it. So um, this is Walmart's CEO on using AI. Quote: We've used multiple LLMs to accurately create or improve over 850 million pieces of our data in the catalog. Without the use of generative AI, this would have required nearly 100x the current headcount to complete in the same amount of time, end quote. Thoughts? Um, I was excited to hear it because, as you said, I feel like this is kind of the topic du jour around AI. We see the huge infrastructure investment. How do you offset hundreds of billions of dollars in infrastructure? And we haven't seen you know, real world applications. Where is AI making money? Where is AI saving money? And I think this is probably the biggest example we have yet. I mean, you could, you could put some numbers around it, right? 100X this workforce, maybe you're talking about a workforce that makes 100 million a year, something like that. Maybe it's 50 million. But I mean, you're talking about the reduction of need for you know, hundreds of millions, let's say safely, in incremental cost that it probably would have taken to do what Walmart is talking about. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, that's obviously not a hundred billion dollars when we talk about the infrastructure that's being laid down every year, but I think it is a step in the right direction. And if Walmart can do this, so can, I think every other fortune 500 company find these applications. And this is just one example in Walmart. I bet Walmart mm -hmm. has several dozen things they could do like this. And we're going to be hearing more about that from Walmart and other companies over the next months. So let me be devil's advocate here is they talk about the 100x required nearly 100x the current headcount. The current headcount could be 10 people doing that. Probably not. But could be. Let's let's say it's 10 people though. 10 people, your average cost for 10 people is probably 100 grand a year. 100x that, now you're talking about a 100 million dollar workforce. And yeah. so it is it becomes a big number even with small that's good. workforces yeah, that's a good when you think about the, the multiplier on it. Yeah. Fun. Are there anything, any other ones that kind of jump out? I've kind of, I mentioned that, you know, we just haven't seen as many as I think I would have hoped. I think the other big ones, obviously, and it's hard to parse them out because they're sort of embedded in bigger businesses, but companies like Meta and Google, both using AI to dynamically test ads, create ads, make ads that are more attractive to customers. Um, I don't know how to break out from their numbers what percentage of growth right. is a tailwind maybe from those improved ads. But I think that's an example of how can companies make more money? They can improve the products that they deliver to customers. How can they save money? Obviously, it has to do with augmenting the humans that work at the businesses. Yeah, I guess on that front, uh, Google long rumored to be seeing this negative impact from uh, generative AI on their search business. Search grew at 14% in the June quarter. Same growth as what it grew year over year in the March quarter. And then you have Meta, their guidance for September. If you take the high end of their range, which typically they exceed the high end of their range, implies 20% growth and year over year. And that compared to what analysts were expecting going into the June print, which was 15%. So uh, and agree with you. I didn't pick up on, on the call or any of the other commentary from anyone else outside of it that they were able to really identify, like put a specific number on it. But that's that's pretty powerful. Uh, something's, if you say the economy is kind of in neutral mode right now and you're seeing 20% growth off of some pretty big numbers, something's going right there. And I would likely think that AI is behind it. That's another, that's another good one. Uh, Let's jump on to our next topic, which is one that's gotten a ton of traction this week and uh, related to Google and this potential breakup. And so just rewinding a couple of weeks ago, Google, of course, has lost this uh, lower uh, court case. We talked about it on last week's Deep Tech. Uh, this is uh, related to the District of Columbia, uh, uh, excuse me, D.C., 
uh, their, their uh, district court and uh, it's being appealed. But the basic idea is that Google can't pay for placement. So uh, all this money, this 50 billion they spend a year on TAC. Uh, but as now that's the was the news a couple of weeks ago. And then there's been further reporting from Bloomberg around it that uh, this may include a form of a breakup. And so everybody's head starts spinning around like, here we go. Microsoft, uh, late 90s, early 2000s on this whole uh, regulatory breakup typically isn't good for a stock. Uh, let's just take the, the case that uh, this gets kind of caught up in the courts for the next three to five years. Can Google still work with this overall headwind? I think it can. I think, you know, the Microsoft analogy, people look at it and say, okay, this, this overhang of regulatory issues that Microsoft dealt with in the early 2000s, that was a problem for the stock. I actually think that's misremembering the reality, which is Microsoft just wasn't innovating at that point. So right. maybe they that missed was, the maybe, phone. They missed like, the what phone. What were they focused right? on? It, I'm it, trying to think back. Like, what was my, where was their head at? Like, new features in Excel, or what were they talking about in 2002? I mean, in 2002 is even earlier. Well, I was going to say for the phone, it was Windows Mobile, right? They were betting on things that looked more like a PC in your pocket than this revolutionary That's right. sort of touchscreen yeah. paradigm. Exactly. Um, and obviously that didn't, that didn't play out. I think though, the, the takeaway in my opinion is just because you're under regulatory investigation, and this will probably last several years, years for Google with appeals and things like that. It doesn't mean that you have to sort of die and go into stasis as a company or a stock. Right. And the question is really, is Google going to continue to try to innovate? I'm more worried about the other stories in the news from Eric Schmidt talking about how Google's basically soft. You know, mm -hmm. the employees work from home. Nobody ever gets fired. And we've been saying for a long time, I think more than a year now, that Google has needed the meta treatment, a year of efficiency, go and cut 10% of the workforce and just send the message, like, let's get mm -hmm. to work. I really wish they still would do that as a Google shareholder. So uh, recap what Doug's talking about is Eric Schmidt was at uh, some student forum at Stanford, made those comments about uh, Google being soft for those reasons, later retracted the comments, but they were already said, and I probably wish you wouldn't have said them, but it was just confirming to everything that you've talked a lot about is that they kind of need this edge. If you look back at what these cuts, because uh, two years ago, we were talking a lot about big tech cuts and uh, Meta led the way. They let go just over 20% of their entire uh, force. It was a big deal, the year of efficiency, of course. But when you look at what Google was, they were cutting more like 10%. So that's where Doug gets that 20, that additional 10% to get to where kind of Meta would have been. And so uh, all of this uh, makes sense. Um, as I heard uh, as I was processing Schmidt's comments, I was thinking Google knows this. I mean, Sundar has talked about this, about um, becoming more uh, innovative and increasing the pace of innovation at Google for the last couple of times on their quarterly earnings. And so from your perspective, you just kind of want to see the rubber hit the road with headcount reductions. I mean, words and actions are not the same thing, unfortunately. And I think we keep hearing this narrative from Google, but until you go in and you say, okay, there is some percentage of our workforce that is not performing to a standard that we want to uphold for everybody, and you eliminate and you send the message to everybody, I think those words don't matter because people are not going to embrace that. I mean, as many smart people as there are at Google, and I'm sure there's a lot of people that work really hard and want to work really hard. It is hard on a culture when you've got some portion of that workforce that is working from home five days a week and probably checking in 15 hours a day because they could get away with it and they still get away with it. Mm -hmm. And I just think Google, you know, it's not, it's not inconsiderate, I think, as a company and as a management team to act in the best interests of not just your shareholders, but all the other employees. Right, like you need to set a tone right. if you want to be a relevant company and you want to create great products. And I think some people in Google really want to do that. Some people really care. Those people need to hopefully get their way, right, and have some of the fat that's there get eliminated. It would be the best thing for everybody involved, probably even the people who get fired. Makes sense. Well traveled road. Agree with that. I think when you also kind of uh, play into this, 
uh, how we think about Google, it's worth noting that uh, Deepwater, we do own shares of Google. We think this is one of the best positioned AI companies. They own the large language models. They've got distribution, call it three and a half billion daily active users across their six different products. And then, uh, uh, so we've got uh, th those uh, kind of two key cornerstones. And so we're still uh, very optimistic about where this ultimately goes. We are, and I think the reality of this whole question around what happens on the regulatory side, I think misses the bigger picture, which is regardless of whether get Google gets split up, stays the same, the question is really, what do consumers want? They want search that works, they want search that's fast, and I think increasingly they want search that incorporates AI-driven results, Google's doing all of those things. They still have the distribution. Even if they were broken up, they still have the brand name. You still Google things when you search. And so I think fundamentally, if they have to change how they pay for distribution or maybe don't pay for distribution at all, I still think consumers mostly want to use Google because they know it works and it's been working for them for the last decade plus. Love it. I would be remiss if I didn't weigh in just on the, some of the parts because it's been a part of the conversation I think that if you would break this up, there would be, of course, immediate concern about people, about kind of unlocking value. I think that this is worth two and a half trillion ish. Uh, it's at around two trillion today. If you just I'm based on the breakup, excluding kind of what's going on, I won't go through all those details. I have posted those on X, and we'll jump to our final topic, which is uh, just kind of looking forward here uh, in terms of uh, Nvidia, and just wanted to. Uh, have the conversation like all eyes on tech right now are focused on the 28th and uh the we've seen this we'll call it a flash crash in ai a couple of weeks ago the nasdaq uh traded off call it a six seven eight percent and now is recovered it's basically at the same point where it was about uh before that weekend with what happened with the yen trading and that hot um kind of uh, a gdp number uh so when you uh, uh, put all of the, or sorry, the, 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 the soft jobs number came out on a Friday and then uh, followed by that weekend. And as you kind of think forward, we're going to go more into the details on the numbers in a week, but just kind of big picture, uh, what's on your mind as we go into NVIDIA? The biggest question, I think, is uh, does this reported, we don't know if this is true or not, but the reported delay of the Blackwell chip, does it really matter in terms of numbers? Uh, and do investors care? If it is true and uh, that's something that they talk about on the call, will investors even care? Um, it feels like it's, at least amongst people who follow NVIDIA closely, pretty well out there in the news. And I think the stock got hit on that on the same day, I believe it came out as that yen carry blow up period we sort of had. Mm -hmm. um, and so obviously people have processed the news. Um, there's always someone who doesn't know. So it's one of the great sayings in investing. And so who knows if they talk about it in earnings, maybe it's a negative. But I think the reality is this, whether or not Blackwell is delayed, it feels like we continue to get strong signals that there's huge demand for these chips. The demand has not really lessened over the past several months since NVIDIA last reported. And whether those customers take H100s for a little bit longer, or if the Blackwell is on time, is probably irrelevant to the right. next two to three years because NVIDIA is still going to be at pole position as the chip leader here for AI. I think what's on my mind going into this, it's just about what growth is going to be in 25 and 26. The street's looking for 16% revenue growth in 2016 and 2026, uh, down from you know hundreds of 250% in the most recent quarter. And so uh, that's what my mind's at. And what I'm specifically looking for is commentary about how long there's supply constrained. I think I say through the end of the year, through the first part of next year, that's where my head's at. Cause that kind of helps get a better understanding of what happens next year with the growth rates. Uh, we'll be back with more on NVIDIA before they report the quarter, but that's a wrap for this week's Deep Tech 315. Bye for now.